had you up here, I was supposed to take a moment and remind you that this coming Saturday, from 9 o'clock until 11 o'clock, we are having the Summer Olympics for grades 2 through 5. And so moms and dads, this is going to be helpful for you because it is the Saturday before they start back to school. It's one more opportunity for you to go get out and go run around. And so uh, we want to make sure that we get as many of our kids here for that. There's going to be a lot of games. There's going to be, I think there's pizza or something going to be showing up. And they'll have some awards and all of that. Uh, there is a sign-up sheet out in the lobby. And so parents, if you would, if you have plans on being able to be here for that, please sign your kids up for that. If you have questions, contact Jeremy or Holly Knox. They are the ones who, have, uh, who are taking on that, we're, we're calling this ministry the Image Bearers. And so we want, if you have questions about it, get in touch with them so that you can find out more about it. We, um, tonight we're going to pick up an, on another study and in the discussion of, of what it is that makes churches of Christ kind of stand out from all the different groups that we see under that umbrella of Christendom. You know, our world, our world just kind of sees all these groups kind of thrown in together into one pile. And when people who are not accustomed to our practices, when people who are not familiar with who we are, what we believe, and why we believe it, when oftentimes when they come through our doors, they're gonna, they, they see some things and they hear some things that are a little different from what they have come to believe Christianity is supposed to be. And throughout the course of the summer, or throughout the course of the year, we've, we've taken some time on Sunday nights to, to address some of those questions. What is it that makes churches of Christ stand out from the rest of these Christian groups that exist in our world today? And, and to sum it up in a word, we've, we said it's, it's really, it's this concept, this philosophy of restoration. The philosophy that that if any of God's teachings and if any of God's practices have been lost to time or have been lost to neglect or have been lost to purposeful oversight, the Lord expects His faithful followers to restore those things to their rightful place in our lives and our practices and our beliefs. And the fact that you can actually put restoration into practice tells us that that's happened over the course of, of history. In the Old Testament, we saw where it happened with the Jewish people on two or three different occasions. We saw some major restoration periods. And, and we, we believe that there were some things that, that over the course of, of time that perhaps got lost within the broader, that broad concept of Christianity. And so our goal... Our goal has simply been to go back to the Bible and we want to restore those things. But let me add to that, restoration is not... It, it is putting back into practice things that, that God has called for, but it's also the idea of maintaining those, right? You don't want to go restore something and then one or two generations later it be lost again. And that's one of the reasons why we take the time to talk about a lot of these... We're taking the time to talk about a lot of these different questions. And I would add one more aspect about restoration. I would also encourage us to be careful when we think about the practice and the philosophy of restoration. I think we also ought to be very careful to not get sucked up into the belief that we have perfected the art of Christianity. It seems to me that as you look throughout history, every generation, every era, if you will, of the Lord's church has had to come back and reevaluate certain things where they are. Some you may have found, which, which I, I think we found here in America most certainly, I think, you know, a century or two ago, we found a need to come back and take a look at some of these practices. Why are we worshiping in the form that we are worshiping? As we're going to talk about tonight, we're having a couple lessons on the way that the church is organized within the congregation. Why, you know, why we, we needed to reevaluate that. But I think it could be just as applicable that another generation or two later on, you may have the forms right, 
but somewhere along the way you might get the heart wrong. And restoration of, of true Christianity employs both. Both the form and the heart. So let's be careful into ever thinking that, that our generation has perfected all of it because we're still human beings. There's always something that we need to be that we need to be reevaluating in our own minds. Does that mean that we've lost our souls? No, it doesn't mean that at all. It means that we are coming to the Word of God with humility. It means that we are coming to the Word of God sincerely wanting to simply be Christians in a really complex world. I want to give you that. I just leave you with that thought on restoration. We're, last time, we kind of started a... Uh, this is a couple of weeks ago. We, we started a conversation... That, that, that got into this question of church government, church organization. I, I guess in a way you could say it, it's this question of who's in charge around here. And I want to come back to that tonight to get a second part. But last time we, we, we looked from the really broad perspective and we talked about the different kinds of church governments that exist out in our world today that you find along the way. You find that, that Episcopal system, that Presbyterian system, and then you find what's been dubbed the Congregational system. I'm not going to bog you down in those details again. You want to know what, that, what, what we talked about there, go find... We, we've got this podcast. Jackie's done an awesome job with putting together a podcast for us here at Highland Heights. We were talking about that a little while ago. That thing is reaching out to a lot of different areas of our country right now. If you haven't checked that out online, please go do that. But you can download that sermon and you can listen to it or get a copy of it from the office. They can provide that for you. You can figure out what we talked about there. But here was the, here was the ultimate conclusion we came to, that we in Churches of Christ, we, we've adopted this congregational system, which basically means this. Each congregation of the Lord's church takes care of themselves. We don't have a central headquarters. We don't have a governing body that, that exists outside of our four walls that tells us what we're supposed to be doing and what we're supposed to be, leave, what we're supposed to be believing. We, we take care of ourselves. And we do that because when we go to the Bible, we really firmly believe that this is what God set up. This is how, this is what you see happening with churches all throughout the New Testament. What I want to do tonight is I want to, I want to go within that congregation. When you step in, you can talk about the broad congregational system, but when you go inside of the congregation, who's in charge around here? What, what is that supposed to look like? And I'll go ahead and give you the warning like I did last time. This is going to be one of those lessons that's probably more educational in nature. I don't know that it's going to be one of those that just absolutely makes you walk away going, being absolutely inspired. Okay? But I think it's an important lesson. Because again, what you're going to find is what we practice within our congregation does indeed look different from what you're probably going to find in most churches, most groups that claim Christianity as their faith. So who is it? Who's in charge? Well, particularly among evangelical type groups, you're going to have this term, probably the most common term that you hear about the church leader is the pastor. And and it, this has become such a common term associated with Christianity that when you simply open up the dictionary, you get a definition like this. It is a minister in charge of a Christian church or congregation. That is, that is the cultural, understood English definition of the word pastor. And to be honest, let's just call it what it is. This is the idea that the vast majority of people who who hold some sort of Christian faith, this is, this is what they have come to adopt and understand as being the one who is in charge of that church. This is the, the pastor is that primary figure who, who leads it and who's in charge of it. Now outside of these walls, I, I am often retur- referred to as Pastor Corey or Pastor Waddell. I've heard that a lot. Um... And, and I, I'll be honest with you, the truth of the matter is that it always makes me feel a little uncomfortable to be called that. Uh, 
and, and we'll talk more about that. In, and, and maybe, the, and really the reason is because certainly within churches of Christ, we don't use that terminology. Corey's not referred to as the pastor around here. And we, we don't refer to any of our ministers as the pastor. We don't use that terminology, and there is a reason for it, which we'll discuss here in a while. I will say this, however. When that happens to me, I'll just go ahead and let you know, I, I don't make a huge fuss about it, because I've also come to understand that, that the vast majority of people who use the term pastor have basically made it synonymous with the preacher. They honestly don't understand that you can separate the difference out. And so I also know that and, and, and I also know that, that when people call me that, they're they're trying to be respectful. They're trying to, to just make a reference to, to what it is that I do. And and so in general, I will tell you I don't raise a big stink about it. Because when somebody's just simply introducing me to a group of kids or they're introducing them to me to their friend they're not asking for a deep theological discussion over what, my, over what my job role is. Hopefully, it opens up doors later on and to, to talk about it. And, and, you know, somebody says, oh, you're a pastor? And I'll say, well, yeah, I, I preach. I'm the preacher for Highland Heights. I will do that. And sometimes it leads to more conversations. Most of the time it doesn't. But the truth of the matter is this. I'm not the pastor. I'm not. And, and as we go down through here, we're going to find that that is a biblical term. But it's, it's not taking the shape of what most people in our world today have come to know as pastor. And when people walk through our doors in churches of Christ, they'll notice it, doesn't, it won't take them long to, to figure out if they hang around for a little bit to know that, well, we don't call any of our ministers pastor. And that is something that that's, causes us to stand out from some of the others. So why is it? Why, why don't we use that terminology? Who, who do we refer to as those who are in charge around here? Well, let, let's point this out. God has indeed given us His instructions and revealed to us how He wants His church to be organized. Let's make sure we understand that there is no question about it. The Lord has shown us a pattern, if you will, of how he wants the individual congregations to be organized. You know, when Paul writes, the inspired apostle writes to, Tim, to Titus, in Titus chapter 1, verse 5, this is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what remained into order. And so what was Titus doing? Well, we'll find that Titus was, was putting elders, elderships into place. He was helping to bring some of that organization around. Uh, so, so that those congregations in Crete were functioning and, and operating the way that God wanted them to be operating. But I do also think it's worth noting that as, since we are going to be talking about the organization of the church, let me also make this point for you. The church in and of itself is not an organization. It's, it's not a business or a social club as we have a tendency to treat it. It is a family. It is a body of believers. But there must be organization to it. And God in His infinite wisdom has revealed to us how the church is supposed to be structured. But what I also want you to understand, we're going to start talking about these different congregational stewardships in a minute. We also need to understand that even though God has told us that there is a, a certain structure to the congregation, it doesn't mean that those within those various stewardships are the ones who do all the work. Every member of the Lord's church is a minister, a servant, who is striving to help out the family of God, who is working to put their individual talents and skills to use. We have all been given special abilities by God. We have all been blessed with skills and knowledge that He expects us to put to use within this family. And so to that end, I want you to understand that every Christian is a minister in that sense. But what is it? What is the structure that God has given for His church? First and foremost, we will acknowledge that Jesus is the only head. 
People talk about who's in charge of that church, who's heading that thing up. This is something we talk about, and I think deep down we know, but we really need to stop and think about it. Because sometimes, sometimes as we get caught up in all the, the actions of the church, and let's face it, sometimes we get caught up in the politics of being part of a church. Sometimes we do have the potential to forget who is in charge of this church, who it belongs to. We let circumstantial things cloud our understanding of this. Sometimes when, when, you, when you start trying to figure out who gets the major say-so, who gets the final word in a congregation, we start getting clouded by, the, by thoughts of, well, wh- who's been here the longest? Who's got the most family here? Who donated the most money or the most property or, or, or who makes the most noise? Who's the squeakiest wheel around here? They're going to be the ones that actually wind up in practicality, you know, quote, running the church. Let's make sure we never forget that this is Jesus' church. It's not mine. It's not yours. It's not your family's. It's Jesus's. Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 22 and 23, And he that is God put all things under his, Jesus' feet, and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. And as we've read in, in our Sunday morning series, Ephesians 5.23, he said, For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. And that's why the church is not an organization like a business. It is a body. It is Christ's body. The Bible describes the church as the body of Christ, with Christ as His head. The, the church is described as a kingdom, with Christ as its king. The church is described as a bride, with Jesus as her groom. And so we always need to remember, above all else, Jesus is the head of the church. No man, no woman takes that role. But within the congregation, we do have what I'm going to call congregational stewards. God has instructed that qualified members be selected and appointed to various stewardships. And I'm using that word in, instead of position, not so much because of semantics. I have no problem with the word position. But I think sometimes we do tend to view a position as something that someone is put in that gives him authority or power that's not really theirs. A stewardship, however, is something that we've been entrusted with. It's not yours, but the one who owns it has placed it in your care to tend it, to preserve it, to help it flourish and to take care of it. And so as we come inside of the congregation, the church belongs to Christ, and those who are given these responsibilities of stewardships are servants. All of them are positions of service. And the first one that we notice is that when you open up your New Testament, you're going to find that every congregation is expected and aims to have elders. There are three words that the New Testament uh, uses to denote this particular stewardship. The first term is elder, presbyteros, it, and it means an older man. And, and by saying older man, that is, a, that is a head nod toward his age, but also with the concept of experience and maturity involved with that. You also have the word poimen, which gets translated as pastor. Or maybe a more modern term would be shepherd. And when you think about it from that regard, when it, it doesn't take a lot of work to stop and just simply start uh, to, to, to think about what a shepherd does for a flock of sheep. And that's what you have happening with this role, with this particular stewardship. You have a group of men who serve as the shepherds. They are tending to the flock. They are taking care of that feeding. And, and we'll get there in just a minute. But, so you have the word pastor or, or shepherd. And then you have the word episkopos which is the, the old way, the, an old way of translating that word is a bishop. Perhaps a more modern way that you're going to see in some of the newer English versions is going to be the word overseer. And, and again, it doesn't take long. You, you understand what that means. Somebody that's, that's keeping oversight, that's a, there, there's an aspect of management to that. And this is where it's worth noting that along the way, some of this terminology has gotten blurred. 
I told you before that the idea of a pastor is a biblical word. There is a biblical concept of a pastor. But here's what's happening. Here's what you need to understand, though. When you go to the Scriptures, you don't find a single man serving as a single pastor over any congregation. Somebody says, well, what about Timothy and Titus? Timothy and Titus were not pastors. They were young men who were sent to congregations and they were men who had been given a charge by an inspired apostle. They had specific authority from an apostle. They were not pastors. They were preachers, evangelists who had a certain role. And so this is one of the reasons why you're going to see within churches, the primary reason why within churches of Christ we don't talk about our ministers as being pastors because that's a term that refers to the elders, which is a different, a different stewardship. I want you to notice something that as you go through, and again, you probably know this, as you go through the New Testament, these three words are used interchangeably. I'll give you a few passages to go take a look at on your own that you can write down. Uh, Acts chapter 20, verses 17 and verse 28. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 through 4, which we had as our scripture reading tonight, uses these terms interchangeably. And then in Titus chapter 1, verses 5 through 7, you see these words used interchangeably. When they pop in, you know that they're all referring to the same stewardship. And so based on their definitions, here's what you're going to find. This terminology suggests age, experience, spiritual maturity, respectability, concern, and example of life. You will also find when you go to 1 Timothy and to the books of, Ti in the books of 1 Timothy and Titus that this is a role that is reserved for men, of the, for men who fit those qualifications. You see those laid out in 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 7, Titus chapter 1, verses 6 through 9. He gives the instructions concerning the qualifications for elders. And we won't take the time to go through all of those tonight. I, maybe another point, we'll, we'll pick those apart. But as far as the responsibilities, their responsibilities to the congregation are summarized perhaps best in Acts chapter 20, verse 28. I, would, I could also point you to 1 Peter, the 1 Peter passage we read tonight. But see, in Acts chapter 20, verse 28, Paul knows that he's about to be arrested and eventually go to Rome to plead his case before Caesar. And so when his ship lands on, the, on an area called Miletus, he reaches out to the elders in Ephesus. And he says, I want you to come meet me because I have a pretty good feeling it's going to be the last time I get to see you. And so in this emotional exchange with a group of elders that he was very close to, Paul has these words to say to them. He says, Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all of the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which, is, which He obtained with His own blood. Now that's a really serious charge to keep. It's a really serious charge to keep. And it is not to be taken lightly. Regarding how many really kind of hinted at this, but let's just go ahead and state it. How many elders are supposed to be over a congregation? Well, here's what we know. It's not one. You go down and you look at all the different references to elders within local congregations, it's always a multiplicity of elders. And those elders are chosen from within the congregation. In my, in my judgment, the best case scenario is to have those homegrown elders those who have been part of that congregation for an extended period of time, who know the people, who know the needs of the people, and, who, and ideally who perhaps have even been groomed to take on that position, to take on that stewardship, rather, as we've said. And so it's another very compelling reason why we in Churches of Christ do not practice that single pastor system that has been so prevalent today. You come in through, the, through our doors... If there are men who are qualified, you're going to find a body, a multiplicity of elders who are the shepherds, the overseers of that congregation. Second stewardship that you find mentioned within the Bible is that of deacons. The word deacon, Greek word diakonos, it's a very common term actually. The word simply means servant. And as you go through the Greek language, as you go through the New Testament, this word for servant is used in reference to basically anybody who would render any kind of service. It's not reserved just for the stewardship of deacon, this particular word. For instance, 
As you read through the Scriptures, you'd find in John chapter 2, verses 5 and 9, that domestic servants were called the diakonoi. That's the plural form, the diakonoi. Civil rulers, Romans chapter 13, verse 4. Civil rulers were known as servants. You also found them uh, followers of Christ. Jesus is telling us that we are to be servants. When you talk about, look at Mark 9, verse 35, Jesus speaks about the relationship that His disciples are supposed to have one another, to one another. Serve one another, right? Be servants in our relationship to each other. And then you would also find, you also find it used in, in terms of, uh, of certain women along the way. The one that, that always stands out is Phoebe. In Romans chapter 16, verse 1, Phoebe was a sister who served in a very, very strong capacity within a local congregation. What was the extent of her service? We don't know. But we know that she was a very devout servant within that congregation, and there are other women throughout the course of the New Testament that are referred to in similar terminology. But this, what I want you to see is how general of a term this is, but when it comes to the congregation, we also find that the Holy Spirit deemed it necessary to put in a, a special stewardship within the local congregation of deacons. And the qualification for deacons is listed in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 8 through 13. Speaking about deacons are expected, if, if somebody's going to fulfill this inspired stewardship, then it is to be a, a husband of one wife who has similar character and similar, uh, a similar spirit to that of what you see described in elders in the passage up above it. And so you find those laid out again. We won't take the time to go all the way through it, but I want you to, I'll let you go read that for yourself. Summarize, what, what's the job of a deacon? What, what is he supposed to be doing within the congregation? Well, summarize, their function is to serve the church in whatever capacity they have been appointed to. The earliest form of deacons, they're never actually called deacons, but the earliest form of it is, is found in, in Acts chapter 6, where you have a group of men, when, when a problem arises there in Jerusalem, when you have the Hellenistic widows who are not being fed in the daily distribution of food, and the Christians come to the apostles and they say, hey, we got a problem going on here. we got some ladies that are being overlooked and they're going hungry. And so they put a group of men in place who had the responsibility of what? Serving tables. And that is seen not as a demeaning work, but a necessary function of the church to step up and serve in whatever capacity that the church needs your help in. You go through, we have several deacons that, that serve here at Highland Heights. I would encourage you some point, come back here. If you don't know who they all are, there's a board right back here in this hallway in which you can see their pictures. And you can also, I believe you can also see the, the various ministries that they are connected to. For whatever it's worth, these men are also not charged with doing all of the work. They're charged to make sure that the work gets done. That means that they need your help. These men have a lot of different ministries. Some of these men have two or three different ministries that, they're, that they are responsible for. And they're looking for people to be involved to help them out with it. Make sure you reach out to one of these deacons and say, if you're not involved in something already within the work of Highland Heights, make sure you reach out to them and say, hey, I'm here, what can I do to help you? I know they would appreciate it so very much. So you have deacons that, that fall into that that, that, that are one of those stewardships. And I'll give you this that you can go read as well. For further evidence of elders and deacons as officially recognized positions, I'll go ahead and use it, positions in the early church, consider what Paul says in Philippians chapter 1, verse 1. He says, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the overseers and the deacons. And so within churches of Christ, we seek to have men that fill both of these roles, overseers or elders and deacons. Real quick, and we won't spend a lot of time here, but, but there are two other terms, two other stewardships that you find as being part of the, the structure of a congregation. You find these terms evangelists and teachers. 
Evangelists literally mean, the word evangelist literally means a messenger of good. And, and you would go to First and Second Timothy and Titus to see this, these, uh, this particular stewardship and the responsibilities outlined. These are all things that you find Paul encouraging Timothy and Titus to do as evangelists in their respective works. They were to spread the gospel. They were to strengthen the faith of those who had already given their life to Jesus. They were to spend time refuting error when it crops up. They were actually given the task, as we read in Titus chapter 1, verse 5, if there was a need to organize churches, maybe they don't have elderships. Who's supposed to take over that position? Well, if you have an evangelist, the Bible says he, he has a responsibility to help make sure that gets done and not act as the single pastor. And then they are to engage in public ministry of the Word. And we would find, stated in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 5, he, he very pointedly says, Timothy, do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. Let us know that this is a specific function within the church. Does it mean that if a church doesn't have a full-time paid evangelist that they're unfaithful? No, it doesn't mean that at all. But it means that this was something that we do see happening within the Lord's church. And it is authorized and, and sanctioned, if you will, by God. We also have references to teachers. Teachers is going to be probably the broadest one out there of those who have, who have a function within the, 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 the organization of the Lord's church. The work of teachers is everywhere. And it is inherent within the nature of Christianity. It is a role that ideally every Christian should be capable of fulfilling conveying knowledge and wisdom. But it is also a specific function that is recognized in the New Testament as part of the Christian church. Acts chapter 13, verse 1, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 28 and following, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. The qualifications for teachers are pretty obvious. It is to be mature Christians who study and learn and are willing to teach other people what God wants. That's the qualification of a teacher. Paul will write in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. There may have been those who have abused it, let me, let me back up here. This is a perpetual charge for all Christians that we pass on the faith from generation to generation. We are all supposed to be teachers. We are all supposed to be servants. And so what are, we, what are we concluding here? Well, here's what we're concluding. There is a pattern that is laid out for us in the Bible for the Lord's church. And I know there's a lot of people who, in, in this day and age, that kind of get afraid of that word pattern. Okay? I'm not afraid of it. I'm not afraid to talk about God's pattern. Because it is a biblical term. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 13, Paul wrote, Follow the pattern of sound doctrine, of the sound words that you have heard from me, in the faith and the love that are in Christ Jesus. Now, I know there are a lot of people who have probably abused it and have sought to apply that concept of patternism in ways that God did not intend for it to be. But just because someone misuses a word doesn't mean that we should refuse to use it, right? Especially if it's God's word. We need to use it and we need to adopt it and we need to accept it. There is a pattern for the Lord's church to follow. And in an age where there are so many churches out there you know, basically one on every street corner, it seems. All, everybody's claiming to teach the path to heaven, and yet all have distinct contradictory teachings. Well, how's anybody supposed to know what the Lord's church is? If everybody's claiming to be it, and yet they have clearly contradictory practices and contradictory teachings, how are we supposed to know? The answer's simple. We go to the Bible. We go to the Bible. We read it, we study it, we follow it as best we can. We seek to find that pattern which God has preserved for us and recorded for us in the New Testament. And it is our deepest desire at Highland Heights to submit to God's plan for His church. 
to submit to His plan as far as our spirit and our hearts and our attitudes, but also to submit to it as far as our forms and our organization and our actions. We want simply to be Christians, nothing more and nothing less. And when we submit to His will and to His plan, God will use that submission to build and to grow and develop His church here in Lebanon and anywhere that that's happening in the world. But the first part for us as individuals, in order to be part of a church that is submitting to the will of God, you must submit to God's will as an individual. You must submit to His plan of salvation. You must give your life to Him. Let Him be your Lord. And so tonight, as we wrap this up, we have a basic invitation. If you're here tonight and and Jesus is not the Lord of your life, you have an opportunity right here and now to decide that you're going to submit to His will. If you are not a Christian, you can become one tonight by submitting to Him in the waters of baptism, repenting of your sins, confessing Jesus as Lord of your life. And the Bible tells us that when we do that and when we are immersed in that water, that we are covered, we are clothed with Christ. We are put in contact with His blood. We are covered with His grace. And we are then added to His church to rise and walk in newness of life, to walk in submission to Him all the rest of our days. So if we can help you become a Christian tonight, or if there is some other need that you have, we want to help you. Please let us know what it is right now while we stand and sing.